I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to Bigfoot Case Files. Become a channel member today to get access to some really cool perks. The link is in the video description. Woodruff County, Arkansas, Saturday, February 3rd, 2007. A friend of mine and myself were going to run our dogs on rabbits. I decided we'd go to a cypress slough I had hunted for many years. This slough is about a quarter mile wide on average and has row crops on the north and south sides. We had stopped on the north side of the slough coming in and decided we'd go to the south side to get out of the wind and stay a little warmer. To get there, you turn off the state highway onto a county road and then cut across a field road. There's a place toward the end of the field road that I always stop and look for deer in a U-shaped pocket at the end of a big field. But this time, it wasn't a deer that I saw. What I saw was as tall and wide as a standard door. I would say 6 foot 8 to 7 foot tall and 36 to 40 inches wide across the upper back. I was roughly 200 yards away when I first saw it and I pointed out the truck window to my friend behind me in his own truck to look in that direction. The sun was shining on it and it stood out from the surroundings. It was just huge compared to anything or anybody I've ever seen. As we drove closer, it just stood there with its back to us like it was warming itself in the morning sun. We closed to within 75 to 80 yards and I stopped again for a better look. It was covered with hair from head to toe. The hair looked dark like a walnut stained color with reddish highlights. The hair appeared to be long and lay against the body. It looked wet or like it had a lot of oil in it. It had a sheen or shine to it with the sun shining on it. I watched it for about two to three minutes from this distance and then it turned its upper body to glance over its right shoulder. When it saw my truck, it took one quick long step and disappeared into the woods along the slough. When it turned, it didn't appear to have much of a neck. It was as though the head set down in the front of the shoulders. It was very thick through the upper body. Once it left, I pulled up to my normal parking place, which is about 50 feet from where it was standing. I got out of my truck and looked over where it was standing, but the ground was frozen and there were no tracks. My friend got out of his truck and asked me what the hell I was looking at, and I told him I wasn't sure. If he didn't see it, I wasn't going to say anything. I had a once-in-a-lifetime experience right in front of him, and he didn't know, and I wasn't sure how to explain it without sounding completely nuts. It was the greatest feeling of awe outside the birth of my children I've ever had. Anyway, I went to the back of my truck, and my friend went to his, and we let our dogs out. The dogs made their usual three to four happy-to-be-hunting circles around the back of the trucks, and both of them just shut down. Their tails were tucked between their legs, and they just cowered down right there. We put their leashes on and walked north away from the area we parked, and turned them loose, and they ran and hunted just fine. But as they turned southwest and went toward where the thing went into the woods, they both shut down again. They tucked tail and came back to us. My friend took his dog by the collar and pushed him into the thicket, and the dog just took off running as hard as he could to go to the north. At that time, my friend turned to me and said, What the hell did you see back there? Again, I said I wasn't sure. He said, Well, whatever it was is bad juju for dogs. We loaded up and went looking for his dog. We looked for three days and couldn't find him. On the fourth day, he received a call from a lady that said the dog had showed up the night before at her house. It was about ten miles northeast of where we lost him. Until I told Tall this story this past week, I'd never told anyone, including my wife. I know what I know, and I saw what I saw. It's all the proof I'll ever need. Montgomery County, Arkansas, August 2006, Lake Washita. General Terrain Description Mountains with steep bank and rock cliffs along the Washita River and its upper tributaries, which are now part of Lake Washita. This part of the lake is surrounded by undeveloped timberlands in the Washita National Forest. Witness Profile The witness is a 37-year-old male who is the manager of a restaurant in Hot Springs. He's an avid fisherman and fishes as often as possible. He is very familiar with the typical native animals that are frequently seen around the lakeshore. 
Details of Encounter or Incident The witness was fishing along the banks of one of the coves formed by a small creek that enters the upper part of the lake. The area is uninhabited and no one else was fishing in this particular area. The hillsides are heavily forested and the shoreline of the cove is ringed with heavy brush that is from five to six feet tall. He had fished that part of the lake numerous times before as it was a favorite spot. The witness was fishing along a steep bank when he saw a large animal standing erect behind the brush about 300 yards further up the cove. He at first thought it was a bear, although he had never seen one in that region. Wanting to get a better look at the animal, he started his motor and at a trolling speed he eased the boat along the bank toward the animal. The animal then detected his presence, wheeled around and started up the hillside. The witness quickly gunned the motor to get a better look at the animal. As the motor revved, the animal began to scream loudly as it broke into a hard run. The witness killed the motor and listened as the animal crashed through limbs and brush while it repeatedly screamed. Even after the animal was out of sight, the screams could still be heard for several minutes as it continued its flight from the lake. The man stated the animal was about eight or nine feet tall and covered with light brown hair. When the witness walked up the bank, he determined the brush was from five to six feet tall. He said the animal was about three heads higher than a large man. He stated the animal was at all times walking and running in a bipedal manner. He stated he was unable to provide a more detailed description of the creature because of the brush and timber. As stated, the animal screamed repeatedly until it was out of hearing. The witness said he assumed the animal was screaming at him in fear as it crashed through the woods. The reviewer suspects the sounds were made in anger after the animal walked from the hilltop to get a drink of water on a hot August day and was unhappy to find the man at his watering hole. The witness has told few people about the incident for fear of ridicule. He has returned to that area of the lake many times since the encounter, but has seen no tracks and has not heard any comparable sounds since his encounter. There has been scores of reports from credible residents of Montgomery County for over 150 years concerning these reclusive forest primates. From the sighting location described in this report to the headwaters of the Washita River, the area is generally very sparsely populated and the terrain is very rough and not easily accessible. Sebastian County, Arkansas, Summer 1992 the sighting occurred in the woodlands adjoining the southeastern part of Sugarloaf Lake. The witness is a male who is now in his early 30s. At the time of the encounter, he was 13 or 14 years old. Since the encounter, the witness has hunted deer extensively with bow, muzzle loader, and modern guns and fished routinely in that part of Arkansas until the present time. Even though he was a teenager at the time of the encounter, he was familiar with the known and accepted wildlife in the state. The reporting witness had been visiting a friend of his who is about the same age and who lived in the vicinity of the lake. They had ridden their bicycles around the lake to the south side on a maintained road that dead ended in a small group of lakeside residences. At that point they began riding a trail through the woods that continued toward the southern end of the lake's dam. After they had gone about a hundred yards they decided to turn around because it was late afternoon and they had a long ride back to the friend's house. After they turned around and had ridden a short distance, they heard a hell of a commotion in the woods off the left side of the trail. They quickly looked and saw, about 25 yards from them, the back side of a large hair-covered something running upright on two legs through the timber. The commotion they had heard and continued to hear was the creature breaking small trees as it crashed through the timber. The witness stated that at times the creature used its hands to snap trees that were two to three inches in diameter, and other trees were broken as it ran over them. The creature reportedly swung its arms in front of its body to part the foliage and limbs of larger trees. The animal was soon out of view as it ran up the side of Sugarloaf Mountain. The two boys, of course, left the area as fast as possible on their bikes. After they got back to the maintained road near the residences, they began discussing and questioning what they had seen and heard. 
At the time, neither of the boys knew anything about Bigfoot and had no idea that such an animal existed. They were sure what they had seen was not a human, bear, or any other common animal. The animal was purportedly covered in dark brown, almost black hair. The hair on its head was the approximate length of a woman's with a short haircut. The hair on its body appeared to be about the same length, except that the hair on the body below the upper part of the arms and the hair on the inside of the upper arms themselves was shorter than that on the other visible parts of the body. When specifically asked by the writer after the witness described his sighting, he said that he did not see long hair hanging from underneath its forearms when it swung its arms to part the limbs and small trees in its path. The creature appeared to be about seven and one-half feet in height, and its body was huge. It had broad shoulders and an oval-shaped head, like an egg with the small end down. The head appeared to set closely on its shoulders, as if it had no neck. Its body appeared to be slightly tapered to the waist, although the witness stated the creature was running away from them with its back hunched over, nearly like it was hunchbacked, so they did not have the best view of the head or profile in the waist area. The witness particularly remembered that the creature's arms were noticeably longer in proportion to its height than those of a person's. He said that it appeared to him that the upper part of the arms, between the elbow and the shoulders, were much shorter than the forearms. He restated that the creature was huge and that the legs seemed to be in proportion in size and length to the overall body size. The writer has conducted field investigations of reports from other residents of the area around Sugarloaf Mountain. One resident, who actively gathers information about these creatures from area witnesses such as this one, photographed a series of Bigfoot tracks in the snow on one of the high points on Sugarloaf Mountain a few years ago. The photographs and an article about them were published in a local newspaper. When he and I visited that location later, we found tracks and a well-used trail in the same area. That area of the mountain is about one mile, straight line, from the sighting location described in this report. July 1988, Sebastian County, Arkansas. I was visiting some friends in Huntington, Arkansas in the summer of 1988. We all decided to go to a local lake for some bass fishing. They had warned me that there were tons of water moccasins and to be very careful where I stepped. I was moving along the bank fishing and I was paying a whole bunch of attention to where I was placing my feet, when all of a sudden there was a commotion in the woods about 15 feet to the right of me. When I turned and looked, I could see a very large creature, about seven to eight feet tall, with very broad shoulders, and I could hear a sort of whoop, whoop noise. Thinking it was one of my companions trying to scare me, I moved toward it. At that time, it grabbed the tree trunk next to it and just twisted it off and kind of slapped the ground with it and made a very low guttural growl. At that point, I was more scared than I've ever been in my life. It was really intimidating because its muscles were flexed and its head was tilted down and it was staring right at me. My dad had taught me about encounters with bears and what to do. My instinct was to run, but my dad always taught me that an animal will chase you if you run. I just dropped my pole and looked down at the ground and slowly backed away. The animal followed me a short way and just turned and walked into the woods. When I got back to where my friends were, I told them what happened and they just laughed and made fun of me. I've never been back to that part of the country and now live in the desert where there are few trees. I never went back to that spot. I will never return there again. I still dream about it and it scares me just the same as when it happened. I saw a large gorilla-like animal standing with its knees bent and legs slightly bowed outward. Its face was very long with a very pronounced lower lip, almost like the orangutan that Clint Eastwood had as a sidekick. Its nose was something like a gorilla, but more pronounced, kind of pushed up. Its chin was very long compared to its face. It had a Jay Leno chin. It had very dark brown ape-like eyes. It had reddish brown hair, just like a gorilla, only longer. It was not thick hair, actually very pretty hair, like an Irish setter. There was no smell, but the wind was blowing away from me, towards the animal. 
I noticed that it touched the ground with the knuckles of the left hand as it moved toward me after it twisted off the tree. Since then, I have seen chimpanzees act in a similar manner on Discovery Channel when threatened. I also seem to remember that its feet were different from ours. Not like a monkey, but not exactly like a human either. As it growled at me, its mouth made an O shape. At that point, I lowered my head and backed away very slowly. One thing that I remember was that as it walked away, it kept its knees bent and took very long strides. It walked with its arms to its sides. I would have to say it looked like a female, since it had what looked like large floppy breasts. Once it turned away, it was very concentrated on a particular bushy spot, where it paused, hunched down, then quickly stood up and briskly walked away. The only thing I could figure was that it either had food or young, but I didn't see either since by that time it was about 75 feet from me among the trees. There were no smells except maybe a moldy smell, like a hamster cage, kind of like rotting leaves and stuff. Investigator Daryl Collier interviewed the witness 21st of April 2004. I found his testimony compelling and credible. The witness has never lived in Arkansas and has no memory of the name of the lake or any of the roads that were taken to get to the lake. According to his statement, in 1988, while visiting friends in Sebastian County, Arkansas, the witness had an extraordinary encounter with an unknown bipedal ape-like creature that stood approximately seven feet in height. It was not until later that the witness considered the subject to be a Bigfoot. In questioning the witness, I was able to gather the following additional information about his close encounter. As the witness tried to fish, he began to hear noises emanating from the woods only feet from him. He described the sounds as reminiscent of cattle going through the woods. He looked to see a figure exiting the woods and immediately considered it to be human. It took him only a second or two to discern that this being was not human and was unlike anything he had ever seen. The subject stood straight up and grabbed a small tree, approximately two inches in diameter, twisted it and snapped it off like it was a twig in the presence of the witness. The witness stood in awe. The witness recalled how the subject then began to slap the ground with the tree. The witness explained that the subject then began to vocalize, whoop, whoop, whoop. The subject's eyes were wide open and big. The witness said the subject looked very scared or concerned. The witness felt that the subject could have killed him easily. Had it been a lion, I would be dead now, the witness stated. The subject put its head down and bared its teeth while grumbling or growling at the witness. After a few seconds of witnessing this, the shocked witness began to move down the bank away from the subject. At that time, the subject took a few steps forward and then turned back toward the woods. It appeared to pause briefly and pick something up before disappearing into the woods. As the witness continued to flee back to his friends, he said he heard nothing else but had a feeling of being watched. Visibly shaken and disturbed upon locating his friends, the witness told them of his encounter. His friends did not take him seriously. The group left the area and the witness said he has never had a desire to return. The witness described the subject as clearly female with big breasts. Long pretty hair of a reddish brown or a reddish golden color covered most of its body. The hair was long on its head and shoulders, but shorter on the rest of the body. The subject seemed to have no neck and had a rounded head. The witness said the subject's teeth reminded him of horse teeth. The arms and hands were long. The facial skin appeared brown and the skin on its hands was dark brown. Overall, the incident lasted a minute at the very most, encompassing the first noises of crashing through the woods. In my investigations, I have interviewed many witnesses who perceived that they were victims of intimidation behavior by unseen or unknown tormentors. Usually in reports involving intimidation behavior, the animals remain just out of sight and resort to various noise-making actions in order to intimidate and frighten. Screams, whoops, growls, rock throwing, stick wielding, etc. are all common threads in reports of intimidation behavior. In my opinion, this report is significant in that the witness actually visually identified the subject 
while it attempted to intimidate him. The witness stated that what he saw was indeed a Sasquatch. August 14, 1979, Banff National Park, Alberta, Canada. Myself and three others traveled from Seattle to do some serious backpacking in the Canadian wilderness. We chose the Dormer Pass Trail outside of Banff. The second day on the trail, we took a fork in the trail. We hiked all day on this crummy trail until it petered out in the middle of nowhere about 4 p.m. Must have been a wild game trail. We ate some grub and talked. My older brother and a friend opted to backtrack and find the main trail. Dave and I chose to head due west through the bush to the Cascade Fire Road, which ran north to south. We said our goodbyes and went on our way about 5 p.m. Dave and I hiked west, blazing our own trail. Just before 10 p.m., we came upon a meadow lit up by the afterglow of sunset, when we heard a strange whistle sound come from my left, ahead. A stream was parallel on the left, but a bunch of bushes blocked the view where the whistle came from. We stopped. Now came the sound of something walking through and out of the stream in a left-to-right direction. I expected to see an elk emerge from the bushes and the tree that was to the right of them. Instead, what walked out was a dark creature walking on two legs. It was six to seven feet tall and forty feet away. The head came from its chest, no neck, with the top of the head barely any higher than the top of the shoulders. It kept its right profile to me as it walked across the meadow. Arms kept at its side, hanging past its knee. It seemed a slender creature with long legs. There was a lighter patch on one ankle. No bad smell. Unknown to me at the time, Dave was all the while watching a second creature off to the right. This one was dirty white-colored, quite hefty, in Dave's opinion, exceeding seven feet. He saw mostly its backside as it walked out from a tree that was behind me to the right. It apparently headed for the same grove of trees to the far right as the dark one did. The dark one walked with purpose, like it wanted out of there. Even Dave said the dirty white one walked like he knew where he was going, man. We had all we could stand of this, so we continued out of that meadow with great haste. An hour later, we made it to the fire road at 12 mile post. Yep, still 12 miles back to the car, but we made it. Follow-up investigation report. I interviewed both the author of this report, Raymond, and Dave, the friend he shared the sighting with. The group began their hike about six miles north of Banff at Lake Minnewanka. This map, provided by Raymond, shows the location of the trails taken by the hikers and where Raymond's and Dave's sightings occurred. The figures included later are sketches made by Raymond. Raymond said the whistling associated with the sighting stopped them in their tracks, and it came directly from the place where the animal he saw emerged. It was a whistle he'd never heard before or has heard since. He described it as a high note followed by a lower note, which he mimicked for me. The high and low notes were one to two seconds in duration each, and the low note followed directly from the high note without a stop separating them. Dave said that when he heard the whistle, he expected to see a miner come out leading a donkey. He said the whistle sounded sort of human and that it had a demanding quality to it, as though a miner were whistling a command at his donkey. Instead, the men saw upright walking animals, and apparently each saw a different animal from what the other was looking at. The animal Raymond saw was about 40 feet away, and though it was beginning to get dark, he saw it quite well as it crossed about a 30-foot gap between two pines. The animal was a uniform dark color, except that it had a light patch on one of its ankles. His impression was that the animal was covered with hair, but he couldn't see that for sure. Its arms hung down to about its knees, and they did not swing as the animal walked. The head was very striking to Raymond in that it sat very forward and low on the shoulders, almost as though it were coming out of the animal's chest, he said. It had no neck. Raymond further described the animal as bulky, especially its upper body, and said the legs were more slender and very long. He estimated its height to be six foot two, and said he thought its crotch was a good foot higher than a man's of that height would be. 
The animal was lean, and like the legs, the arms were on the slender side. Raymond could not guess at the animal's gender. The animal's face was darkened, so its features were not discernible. No unusual odor was noticed. Raymond said what he saw could not have been a bear, that no such confusion was possible, and it could not have been a man either, he said. When I asked him what he thought it was, he wouldn't say. At least three times I asked him what he thinks it was that he saw, and he always remained silent. Dave described the landscape leading up to the sighting in detail, of being in a box canyon and climbing up between two spires, of climbing a ridge coming down the other side, then up a loose shale slope. Then they found themselves in meandering high hilly terrain near the tree line, and they heard the whistle. Dave and Raymond were standing together, but apparently Dave saw a different animal from what Raymond saw, and he told me, a large Bigfoot walked out, it took three or four or five steps, and disappeared behind some pine trees. The two men had to go to the left of where the animal disappeared to go where they wanted to go, and upon doing that, they found that behind the pines where the animal had gone was a very steep slope, too steep for a man to walk down. Dave described the animal he saw as gray or dirty white, and said it was definitely covered in hair, which he said was long. The animal walked on two legs like a man, with arms swinging. Since it quartered away from him, though, he did not see its face. When I asked about the animal's height, Dave said that it was the strange thing that he watched it walk, head and shoulders above the tallest of the three pines, when it walked off behind the trees down the slope. And when he and Raymond came to those trees, Dave estimated that tallest tree's height to be 20 to 25 feet. So with the animal on lower ground behind the tree and still appearing taller than it, he thought the animal must be 25 to 30 feet tall. When I asked him whether he had come up with any way he might have misjudged that height estimate, maybe by misidentifying the tree he saw the animal walk behind, he said no, that he thinks he got it right. Raymond suggests that when Dave saw the gray animal as apparently taller than the trees, it was because it was actually walking along a rise behind the trees, a rise that did drop off abruptly then just to the left of the trees in the direction the animal was headed. In a note accompanying the illustrations he sent me, Raymond said, Dave stood immediately to my right, blocking this area. After the creatures passed out of view, Dave proceeded over to the central tree in the drawing. This allowed me to briefly view that area, previously blocked, and I noted what appeared to be a steep rise behind those trees. If Dave was unable to discern that rise during the sighting, he might get the impression the creature was as tall as the trees. Raymond added, I likewise probably blocked Dave's view of the extreme left of the scene where the dark creature walked. The tree it emerged from would be behind the left border of this sketch, and the ravine with the stream would be further left still. It was that central tree that Dave went behind to get a look at yet another ravine. I wanted nothing to do with that area, so I gravitated to the area beyond the left border of this drawing. Then we left. Both hikers had stared silently as the sighting unfolded, each assuming the other was seeing what he saw. The incident was frightening, and it was getting dark, and they were far from where they needed to be. They hit the trail hard and spoke little about what they had seen until they reached the Cascade Fire Road about an hour later. Then they talked about what had happened and realized they had seen separate creatures. Raymond's dark animal came from the left and walked right, and Dave's gray animal came from the right and went away to the left. The animals had closed the distance separating them before going out of sight down the slope behind the pines. Raymond and Dave lost track of one another shortly after their hiking trip, and at my request, Raymond located and got in touch with Dave so that I could interview him. Raymond was reminded by Dave's comment, as related to him by me, of how strong the whistling sound was. And he learned details of Dave's impressions about the incident he had not heard before. Raymond told me in a follow-up phone interview that he doesn't know what it was that he saw, but he does know what it wasn't. Bear, man, elk. Dave was not so coy. He flat-out said what he saw was a Bigfoot. 
Both men described the sighting to me in the same way, and it was clear that both were being truthful. The two hikers heard the whistle, the unusual quality of which caused them to stop. Then each saw separate bipedal creatures that were much the same, yet significantly different, both in appearance and with regard to their position and direction of movement. They did not discuss their independent observations until they had gotten out of there, about an hour later, and then it was revealed that, one, they each saw something like a Bigfoot, and two, what each saw and thought to be like a Bigfoot was not the same animal as the other had seen. Dave's height estimate, based upon how the animal compared to a tree it walked behind, is troubling. It does not seem possible for a Sasquatch to be even half as tall as his estimate. It is one incongruity in a complex story told by two people who shared an extraordinary experience and yet saw separate aspects of it. All else revealed through my investigation of this report, including my sense of the witness's sanity and truthfulness, supports the conclusion that the sighting was real. And with both witnesses reporting essentially the same experience, a very unusual experience, the story is strengthened. So I'm inclined to assume either that Raymond's explanation for Dave's height estimate is right, that the ground the animal walked upon was actually elevated relative to the tree Dave thought the animal was taller than, or that some other misperception is responsible. The fairly big difference in the physical descriptions for the two animals does not bother me. Any two humans could easily differ more, even two of the same gender. Raymond's observation of the very low and forward head position on the animal he saw is reminiscent of that of the great apes. If what the two hikers say they saw was real, the remarkable whistling they heard just before seeing the creatures converge and move away seems likely to have been one communicating with the other. Thanks for listening. Become a Bigfoot Case Files member by clicking the join button below this video. Member perks include two weekly members-only videos with limited ads, monthly members-only giveaways, members-only polls, photos and status updates, and more. We hope to see you as a member soon, and thanks for all your support.